Jason Evans and his wife, Nikki, live in Fort Worth, Texas. Jason was serving as the worship pastor at a church in South Lake when Revive Texas came to town in 2017. During the 50-day revival, God totally rocked his world. Serving with Revive Texas completely obliterated the proverbial box of what ministry and revival looked like for Jason. It energized their family and brought them closer together. Jason loves TTR uh, and, and because it breaks down the denominational walls and equips the body of Christ to do what it's called to do. Together, Jason and Nikki uh, felt God's calling them to be a part of this ministry. <laughs> Uh, Jason and Nikki are originally from South Louisiana. They have four children, Reagan, Parker, Carrigan, and Naya Joy. Jason was, has a bachelor in psychology with a minor in sociology from the University of Southern Mississippi. He also has an associate of worship leadership from the King's University. Jason loves sports, music, and cooking. But I bet he's not a Cowboy fan. <laughs> uh, Chauncey Burks. In 2018, a friend invited Chauncey to a meeting about Revive Texas uh, and, uh, there, uh, in, at Abilene. There he met Revive Texas Chairman Wade and Wesley and was intrigued as they shared about Time to Revive. During the outreach week, Chauncey spent eight days hitting the streets to love on his community. He knew this was what he had been created to do. His favorite thing about serving about Time to Revive is the focus of doing everything out of love. It has impacted him to walk with the body of Christ in love, equipping the church to love, pray with and share the gospel with others. Chauncey lives in Abilene, Texas. He works as a delivery driver and is in school for welding. Chauncey enjoys sports, music, or movies, exploring the outdoors, and of course, spending time with the Lord. The floor is yours, Jason and Chauncey. So uh, Chauncey and I, we're gonna talk to you a little bit today about how to turn a simple conversation into a conversation about Jesus. So how many know that that's, that's kind of a hard thing to do sometimes and it's an awkward thing to do? How do I, you can, I know I'm a people person and I can talk to anybody and I can get into these small conversations, but the, the trick is turning that corner into talking about the weather, into talking about Jesus, right? Yeah. And so hopefully we're gonna give you some tools today uh, to, to help you out with that. And so to start off with, the foundation of it is love. So Chauncey's going to talk here at the beginning a little bit about love being the foundation of that conversation. Yeah, like my bio does say, I love the motivation and where everything comes and derives from love. Um, I had a radical encounter with Jesus uh, about eight years ago where I was going to kill myself and I experienced his radical love. And for me, like, there's many times we're out on the streets. Um, I'll give you a few examples of just choosing love. Um, we were out in Sweetwater, and this girl was pretty far along in her pregnancy. And um, one of the ladies I was with on the team uh, just felt like she was supposed to go get her some some baby clothes and a cradle and, and things like that. So we went and bought all the stuff. Um, that she needs for the baby. We went to her house and cleaned her her whole room for the baby. We set everything up. We served her and loved her, encouraged her. Um, so love isn't just um, a four letter word, but it's actions um, with, it could be service or money or encouragement um, or, or kind of a different scenario. We're out uh, in Abilene at a park in the gospel and praying for folks and this guy comes up and 
Um, he says that we're a bunch of pedophiles. And in, in that moment, I just chose radical love and just said, man, sir, we're actually out here praying for people. Is there anything um, that I could pray for you for? And everything changed, all the walls, his anger, everything came down. Um, and he was like, you know what? Actually, you can pray for me. Um, and so love is my biggest motivation. And I love that's what it's, we're about here at Time to Revive. But some more examples of love. Um, I'm going to look at this real quick. Yeah, more than words. So we've been hitting the streets every every Sunday here in Abilene for two years. And sometimes there's only four of us that go. Um, but choosing to love our community, to see people not just know about Jesus, but encouraging even believers um, is a big part of it as well. Um, Jason, is there something else you want to tag on on that? Yeah, no, I just want to, uh, you know, sometimes we can have an agenda of we want to share the gospel and we have these tools and we want to, um, we want to get to that. And if our motivation to start off with isn't love, if that's not the foundation of why we're doing it. If we're doing it because uh, we think it's an obligation or True Vine is telling us to do it, or we're trying to check off a box for evangelism, uh, we're not going to be successful. Our motivation has to be love. And so like Wade was saying at the very beginning, he was kind of giving you our four um, words. That's our method. Love was this one of them. The other one is uh, one of them is discerning. And so that's what I wanted to talk about now is that you need to discern from the Holy Spirit when you're having this conversation and you're trying to change it from a normal conversation to a conversation about Jesus. It's going to be different every time. I wish I could just give you an A, B, C, and you do A, then do B, then do C, and then that's just how you do it. But people are different. Uh, each situation is different. And so uh, I, I love what Martha was talking about earlier in um, Paul. In 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 19. But Paul says, though I'm free and I belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. Paul's just basically saying that it's different every time. Depending on who he's having a conversation with, it's going to look different. When I'm talking to you, I'm talking differently than when I'm on the playground and I'm playing ball with some guys and I'm going to talk to them. Or when I'm talking to some kids or my kids, it's just different every time, right? And so Paul, that example that Martha gave earlier when he was in uh, Athens and he was with the Greeks, he talked about their, religious, their religiousness and all how devout they were. And he also quoted one of their uh, philosophers that was on the statue. I don't know if you remember that part of the story. It's in Acts 17, 22, but he quotes one of their things. Whenever he's around Jewish people in like Acts 22, uh, he is very Jewish. Paul is a Jew. And so he kept the laws, you know, he did the the uh, ritual way of eating, everything. When he was around the Gentiles, he hung out and could hang out with the Gentiles and eat bacon, you know? And so he just, uh, he was able to adapt. 
And that's what we need to be able to do is just adapt and discern from the Holy Spirit. You know, he's, the comforter is going to give you guidance and wisdom in every situation on how to move forward and what you need to say and how you need to approach it. And so that's love. We talked about love. We talked about discerning from the Holy Spirit. And then the other thing is practically listening. And so Chauncey is going to talk to us a little bit more about listening. Because like Wade said at the very beginning, we have one mouth and two ears. It's more important to listen than it is to talk. So Chauncey, why don't you tell them a little bit about listening and how important that is? Yeah, so I love that scripture um, in James. It says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Uh, Wade touched on that earlier, but, you know, listening to people, not interrupting them, um, not putting your agenda or what you think or just literally just not speaking and hearing them out is uh does does amazing wonders i i was over in sweetwater one 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 day and we literally listened to a guy for an hour and a half uh, the whole time we were out supposed to be ministering almost and we just listened to him and he he opened up about deep things um that he's never shared with anybody before and got to really just get loved on and encouraged. And I think that's a huge part of that is listening. Um, something I want to read is uh, we are often too eager to share our own thoughts, especially when we know the other person needs to hear about Jesus. One common mistake is to jump into a conversation before we really hear what the other person is saying. We all appreciate being heard. When we extend that courtesy to someone, he or she is more likely to listen to what we have to say. By listening first, the other person becomes an individual we care about rather than simply a mission field to convert. And, you know, people see that. People see that. They know that. They can see it in your facial expressions, your body language, um, your mind's wandering, your eyes aren't paying attention, you're not looking eye contact. You know, uh, I think it's really important to be intentional about that time, uh, just listening, looking in them eyes and, and not not talking over them or, or things like that. I just feel like they're a great motivator um, to break walls down and just a conversation to share the gospel um, or, or for them to receive encouragement and things like that. Um, so what the transition would be, uh, how, I, how can I pray for you? So I do this on Facebook. I do this kind of everywhere I go, but just asking them, hey, how can I pray for you today? You know, sometimes in those awkward moments, um, you don't know what to say, but it's the discerning from the Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> like Jason said, it's every sing single situation that's different, every person, every um, encounter is just completely different. And so you're listening to the Lord, um, what he's wanting you to say and, and do, but oftentimes it's just a simple, Hey, how can I pray for you today? And you'd be surprised at how many people not just want prayer, but are really receptive, um, to that. I, um, yeah, I, I do that on Facebook. I do that, um, at the grocery store, at the gas station, um, at the, at the gym, you know, I, I do it everywhere I go. Um, and nine out of 10 people want prayer and they're very open to it. Um, Jason, you got something to ping off that? Yeah. So why do we pose that question? How can I pray for you? Why don't we just ask, can I pray for you? Why is it? How can I pray for you? That's true. That it's definitely a big part of listening. Uh, I would say practically, uh, can I pray for you is a yes or no question. They can say no. How can I pray for you is open-ended. That's not yes or no. And so you're, you're not giving them a chance to reject you right off the bat. How can I pray for you? Uh, the other thing is how that's tied into listening is when you're having this conversation, you're listening to what they're saying. And so if they, they're telling you about a situation that they're going through, or they just kind of mention it in passing, 
You don't have to ask, how can I pray for you? They already told you in the conversation. So you just jump in and say, hey, Miss Deborah, I heard you just say that you're going through this thing with your sister. Man, I'm going to pray for that right now and, and pray for them right then. That prayer is the transition to the gospel. Does that make sense? So we want to listen to what they're saying. Uh, if they give you something to pray about, go ahead and just jump in and pray. Hey, I'm going to pray for that situation. I'm going to pray for you right now. If they don't give you anything, you've just been talking about the weather all this time, then ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? Not can I, how can I pray for you? Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on, another transition to the gospel in your general conversation, Martha brought it up in the last session, it's that 15 second testimony. And so I want, I'm gonna push into that a little bit more. We might actually practice it here in just a second. But if you got a piece of paper, I want you to write this down. Martha did a great job of kind of overviewing it for you. But that 15 second testimony, we, we've really, when we learned this a few years ago, uh, a lot of us has really implemented it into our uh, sharing the gospel because it is such a great tool to transition from just a general simple conversation into a Jesus conversation. And so if you got your paper, First, you're going to write, there was a time in my life. Don't you know everybody has that? There was a time in my life. We all had that. There was a time in my life. And then you're going to write two blanks. There was a time in my life when blank, blank. You can put that on one side of your page. And then in the middle, I want you to put a cross. Just draw a little cross there in the middle of your page. And I want you to think about, this is going to be different for everybody, but think about verbiage. There was a time in my life when I blank blank. And so in those blanks, you're going to put what you were. There was a time in my life when I was lonely, but everything was centered around me. That's me personally. You're going to have something different. There was a time in my life when I was angry and sad. There was a time in my life when I was depressed. Whatever. You fill in the two blanks with your thing. There was a time in my life when I was this and this. And then under the cross that you drew on your paper, I want you to think of this verbiage. Then I met Jesus. Then I encountered Jesus. Then I made Jesus Lord. Then I surrendered all to him. You know, whatever it is, you, you, you have that verbiage your own. So there was a time in my life when I was selfish and lonely. But then I encountered Jesus. You might say, then I made him Lord. Then I surrendered my life to him. Whatever you're, how you want to articulate it. And I received this and this. So you're going to put two nor blanks. There was a time in my life when blank, blank. Then I encountered Jesus or I met Jesus or surrendered to Jesus. That's under your cross. And I received two more blanks. And I received blank, blank. And so what did you receive after you had this encounter with Jesus? Or you surrendered to Jesus? I received joy. And I received peace. So you fill in the two things in your blank. So there was a time in my life when I was self-centered and lonely. But then I encountered Jesus. And I received joy and peace. Now write on your paper. And now I have blank, blank. Two more blanks. And now I have blank, blank. Now I just typically combine my blank. Now I've never been the same since. So my story goes back to this. There was a time in my life when I was selfish and lonely, but then I encountered Jesus and I received joy and peace. And now I've never been the same since. 
And then you finish it up with, write this down. Do you have a story like that? Man, you can just jump right into that conversation. You're just talking with somebody. Me and Miss Patricia are just talking. And then I say, hey, you know what? There was a time in my life whenever, and I just jump into my 15-second testimony, and it opens the door. Because then you're going to ask them, do you, have a, do you have a story like that? And they're either going to say yes, and you can ask them about it, or they're going to say no. Or have you ever heard a story about that? Do you know anybody else? And it just opens up that dialogue. It's so great. You don't have to go through every detail of your life's story. Now, stuff might come out as you have a conversation, but just to kick it off, that 15-second testimony is such a useful, uh, easy tool to use. So, but don't, don't you know that whenever you start having a conversation that Martha even kind of touched on this a little bit, I believe, is it can be awkward. And so Chauncey's going to talk to us a little bit more about leaning into that awkwardness. Yeah, so I, I fully am aware of how it can be really awkward sometimes or uncomfortable or not the norm or um, not cultural or, or however you want to word that. But um, yeah, the Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion. I'm going to read that scripture real quick. It says, um, the wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Um, yeah, God is, God is on the other side of, of uncomfortable. Um, you see him show up and show out whenever you walk through that awkward door. But, you know, we're righteous by faith because of what our faith in what Jesus did for us. And so we have that boldness. And I love that first testimony of just lack of confidence uh, but you know in faith in him and, and walking with him and trusting him he gives us supernatural boldness and confidence and you know there are a few stories of, of doing that with the awkward moments is like I've been in the sauna a few times um, and you know they're half naked guys it's dark in there it's uh super hot and barely breathe you know there's really nothing comfortable about the sauna and um it's awkward but i uh i don't ever want to pass anybody up and whenever i have that that feeling of that urge or that pressing on my heart um it's just i i hate being disobedient i've learned that I feel horrible about it if I feel that prompting and don't obey. And so in those moments, I'm like, I'll strike up any kind of conversation I can, you know, whether it be the weather or the, the shoes they're wearing or, um, man, it's super hot in here or whatever, but, or even just straight up, like, man, I'm about to get out of this sauna. Is there anything I can pray for you for, you know? And, Three times I've I've prayed for people. Even one guy I laid hands on his knee and prayed for healing. You know, it's it's not real easy um, sometimes, but um, I've seen in those awkward moments God just really show up and show out, really touch hearts and lives. And I never would have if I wouldn't have just stepped out in faith or walked in boldness or confidence and and total trust of that he's leading the way that he sets those divine uh, moments up. You know, it, he orchestrates a lot more than we give him credit. Uh, at least from my own mind, I think about that. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I got on that. Yeah. One of the things I love that Chauncey said right there is that God is on the other side of uncomfortable. Um, our team shares the gospel a lot. We do it all the time. And I don't, I don't want to speak for them, but I feel uncomfortable every time. It's an awkwardness to it every time. I get this little nervous knot in my stomach every time I go to approach someone. And the deal is I've learned that I have to press through that uncomfortableness and anyway, and once I start the conversation, that nervousness and that fear goes. 
and I'm able to go, I can be able to share the gospel. But every time there's this weird, awkward, nervousness feeling that you have to press through. And once you step through it, God's on the other side of that uncomfortable. And so like Martha mentioned, sometimes it is going to be awkward. Address that up front. I like to say, hey, I know this might sound weird, but how can I pray for you? I say at the beginning, it's weird. Hey, I know this is crazy, some fat dude from Fort Worth talking to you, but I just want you to know that Jesus, look, you know, I let him know, and it breaks down the wall, like, oh yeah, this dude realizes that he looks crazy, but he knows it, and he's going to talk to me, you know, so just maybe acknowledge that and lean into the part that it's uncomfortable, and that's okay, because God's on the other side of that uncomfortableness. Um. This whole conversation is about taking a simple conversation into a Jesus conversation. And so when I was thinking about that, I was thinking, well, how would I have a conversation about a good movie that I just saw? How, how would you have a conversation about a, uh, the new restaurant in town or something that you're excited about? Think about that for a second. I, I don't think twice. I like to eat. You read in my bio that I like to cook. That's just because I like to eat. I don't have a problem telling you about what's the best Mexican restaurant around my town and how great it was. And I was, man, those fajitas were off the charts. Like, I, I don't even think twice about it. But we have the greatest news ever, the gospel of Jesus and how much he loves us. How much better is that than any movie that I've ever seen that I'm not scared to talk about or any restaurant? It's that it's that that excitement is inside of me and it needs to come out. Right? So just like I would be pumped to tell Martha about that, man, I saw this awesome movie the other night. It was so good. Same thing. It's that same excitement. And it goes back to the original thing that Chauncey was talking about is our motive is love. If our motive is to check off a list that said I shared the gospel, you're not going to have that excitement. But when it's real to you, then you're going to want to tell everybody. Does that make sense? And so I look at John chapter four, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in John chapter four, we know that's the story of Jesus. He's going through Samaria and he stops at the well because he's thirsty, Jacob's well, and he encounters this woman, a Samaritan woman. And there's all kind of great nuggets in there about Jesus. He's talking with this Samaritan woman. The Jews did not associate with Samaritans and they definitely didn't associate with Samaritan women. It was the lowest of the low. But Jesus does. And so uh, when you're out there, you're going to encounter people that don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They probably don't act like you. And it's okay because you have that amazing love of Jesus that you want to share with them. And just like Jesus gave us this example with the lady at the well, it doesn't matter. This is not somebody that a Jewish man would typically talk to. But he had something to say. That's kind of a side note. What I really wanted to share here about John chapter 4 is that this woman, it says in verse 39, that many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She had an encounter with Jesus, and she ran off and told everybody she was excited about it. She didn't say, hey, there's a new flavor of water at the well. You got to taste it. She had an encounter with Jesus, and you got to know about this man. I met a man, she said. And the, it's cool because I love this. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture because you know how much Bible college she went to? None. She didn't even have an amazing training like this on a Saturday about sharing the gospel. She didn't have that. 
She just had an encounter with Jesus and it changed her life. But not only did it change her life, it changed the lives of the people around her, people that she encountered. Because she told them, and like I said in verse 39, many in the town believed because of her testimony. So it's just about having that excitement. The other thing I would say is let the conversation come to you. A lot of times we're so have this agenda of like, I'm going to share, I'm going to do this. Let it naturally come to you. Just like a week ago, I was at the barber. And this was a real barber, not like a, you know, a real barber shop. It's not like a chain thing. And so I was the, uh, I was the whitest person up in there. And uh, I kind of stuck out a little bit. But I'm getting my hair done. And this guy that's cutting my hair, his name's Eric. He says, uh, are you off of work today, boss? Because it's like the middle of the day on a Thursday. Are you off of work today, boss? And I said, no, I kind of have a unique work schedule. It's a little flexible. And he's like, oh, well, what do you do? Okay, you ask. Well, I train people on how to share their faith in Jesus. So I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And so he starts asking me questions. I didn't walk into the barbershop and say, hey, the evangelist is here. Get ready to hear. I just sat down to get my hair cut. And the man started asking me questions. And I was able to answer his questions. I shared my testimony with him. And at the end of the haircut, he stands up and gives me a hug. <laughs> this big, this big, yeah, scary kind of guy. He gave me a hug and said, man, I had this itch, this tugging inside of me. And um, I think you, I would love to talk to you more. I said, well, here's my phone number. You can call me. We'll get lunch. We'll meet up. I'd love to share with you more because I think you have what I need. I was like, well, that man, that's the Holy Spirit that's tugging at your heart right now. But the deal was that just came naturally. I didn't, I didn't go in there with the idea of sharing the gospel. I didn't go in there and preach. I just sat down in the chair and the man started asking me questions and it came up in conversation. And so then I was like, okay, well, this is open door. I'm moving forward with it. Uh, another example of that is a lot of times when I go to a restaurant with my family, I know that I'm going to be praying for my meal. We're going to say the blessing. And so while I'm talking, we always talk to the waiter. I just ask them, hey, man, my family, we're about to pray over our meal. How can I pray for you? It's a simple way to take a normal conversation that you're going to be having with your waiter anyway. Hey, can I have more Coke? Whatever. And changing it to the gospel. Hey, man, we're about to pray. How can I pray for you? And I find that waiters and waitresses, they're always, I'm always having very open. Uh, it's really a right place to share the gospel is where you're having dinner. But uh, they're very open. And so that typically starts a conversation where I can share the gospel. Um, so that's just a couple of examples of not having an agenda, but letting the conversation come to you. Uh, and then lastly, I just want to talk a little bit. I'm going to let Chauncey actually talk about uh, rejection because we will get some rejection and that's okay. So Chauncey, do you want to share a little bit about rejection? Yeah. So I'm going to share a scripture with you real quick. I'm sure you all know it, but just a few verses. Um, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than its ma his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So there's going to be people out there on the streets, maybe not trying to put you on a cross or anything like that, but they may be good. They had their prayer this morning or, um, you know, like that one guy calling us a pedophile or, you know, there may be different scenarios where people just seem like they're rejecting you, but they're not. They're rejecting the gospel. They're rejecting Jesus. And you don't need to be discouraged about that. 
you also need to take into considera consideration the power of a seed. In those moments, you, you may be feeling like you're being rejected, but in reality, you've planted a seed inside of them. Whether it ever falls on fertile soil, good soil, and produces a harvest, you may never know that. But regardless, you're planting seeds. And God sees that. He honors that. And just pray for him. Because Jesus said that. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Um, so don't take it personal. Don't, don't let it uh, shipwreck your faith or stop you from, from sharing the gospel or encouraging you to, to love people. Because um, they did the same thing to Jesus. You know, keep fighting a good fight. Yeah, I would say that even though there is some rejection out there, majority of the time, I'm not rejected. Uh, people are hurting. And they, if you're willing to listen, they're willing to share, uh, is what I found. Uh, most people are willing, when I ask, how can I pray for you? They're, they're ready to let me pray. Yeah. Uh, the few times that I find people say, no, they don't want prayer is when they tell me how religious they are. No, I don't need prayer. I go to church. Okay. <laughs> I do too, but I need a ton of prayer. That's my wife. So, um, you know, I would just say, don't let discouragement discourage you. Don't let rejection discourage you. Just keep on keeping on, fight the good fight.